Hello everyone, I am, I'm pretty excited. Uh, I think today's video is going to be very helpful for a lot of people. Uh, Express LRS, an open source project, Happy Model has adopted some of the designs and is using that open source firmware in order to bring it to, in my opinion, it's really targeted at the micro scene. If you have a much larger quad, you'll be able to use you know whatever receiver you choose to, but these are so stinking small. Look at the size of that. We'll take a closer look down on the desk, but I've also got something that I don't think you've seen anywhere else. And this is a 900 megahertz all-in-one Express LRS VTX ESE flight controller all on one board. This is a prototype. It was handmade as far as I was told. Uh, and this is pretty exciting because even if you don't want 900 megahertz Express LRS and you're looking for 2.4 gigahertz, it's coming. Right? If they can do this, surely they can make a 2.4 gigahertz version. So in about 30 days, we'll expect to uh, see this. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a quick look at kind of the physicalities of the, the different Express LRS components. Um, we're not just going to show them to you or weigh them up here. I've actually flown them. Uh, I went out to a spot I did not that long ago, took my kids out with me. We did kind of a range test. You know, I've talked about this before. Range tests can get some um, unintended or unwanted attention from the FAA. So I took my three kids out, staged them out over the course of uh, a path so that I could have a spotter all along the way. And uh, we do some uh, 10 milliwatt testing on the uh, 2.4 gigahertz and the 900 megahertz. I also take a Mobilite 7 out and we get to see where it fail safes. That one surprised me a little bit, but it's still not anywhere near as good as Express LRS and some of these receivers here. And we'll also be taking a look at the binding process. It's really nothing unusual. It's kind of unique because there aren't any buttons on any of these things. These are limited. Right now they can only go up to 250 hertz on the packet refresh rate. And if you want that next stage that it's capable of, the hardware is already capable of it. It was the firmware at the time that were released that weren't capable uh, up to 500 hertz. Uh, Joseph de Guzman, otherwise known as Kaiju on YouTube, he's got a great video of walking you through op open TX updates, uh, updating the TX, and then updating your RX. And it's really, uh, depending upon the receiver that you choose, that process can get a lot easier because uh, with receivers like the EP2, it has Wi-Fi updates. So you don't have to rewire it to something else, or you can do beta flight pass-through updates as well. And if you've already chosen, maybe you're going with Crossfire, you're going with Ghost, hey, good on you. But I think this is going to be a big, big development in the micro arena. For those of you who come to the channel, you know that almost exclusively I fly micros. And one of the big problems that we have in micros with these all-in-one boards is to get the best, most reliable link, you need to be running D8. And as we know, with FR Sky radios, D8 mode can be a problem depending upon the firmware that's on your radio or maybe you upgraded your radio and now you can't go back. And then we have other issues with FR Sky receivers. You know, what firmware comes on your XM? What firmware comes on your RXSR? And can you bind to it? Well, if we just go Express LRS, we don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. And I think that's a big deal, especially trying to help people. And these things are freakingly tiny. And I, I just, I'm going to buy a bunch of them. I am excited still yet for one more development. And that is the slim or nano size module. That's not out yet. Mm, I would say it's probably going to be another 30 days. You know, there's kind of a chip shortage going on. And all this stuff is linked down in the video description. And I don't want to push you towards it, but you know, Everybody, not just in drones or quads, everybody who's needing chips is having a hard time getting them, the manufacturers that is. So if someone has these in stock, you probably should pick a couple up. So let's get down to the desk. We'll take a quick look at the physicality. We'll go out to the field and we'll fly. And then we'll look at a few of those other things I mentioned. So I've got a bunch of things out here that we're going to run through this relatively quickly because I don't think there'll be that much interest. First and foremost is if you pick up this module, which is the 2.4 gigahertz module, which... There isn't a whole lot to draw your attention to. There's two buttons up here, two buttons down there, uh, USB port. I didn't have a need to use any of that stuff. So, and this jumper, I guess that jumper's there too. I don't even know what it does yet. Haven't bothered to look into it. 
Uh, I I just used it as it came and it worked perfectly. Um, USB port, obviously, you could use that for updating, you know, outside of your radio if you choose to. And the back side, there's really nothing to look at. You can see the different traces there. And then, of course, we have our extension that goes through our project box or our empty module bay. And then we have the antenna that comes with it. So pretty short as far as the horizontal length, but typical length. Uh, when it comes to the vertical length and we have our SMA connector. So that's the receiver. Oh, one thing to note is this does not make the tone that the 900 megahertz version did. It doesn't do the doo 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 or something like that. This one just has a red light that comes on and you can see it through the project box. So that's how you know that uh, it's active and ready to go. Uh, I've got the project box out as a reminder. Not all of our radios come with a project box. Oftentimes what you find is just a module bay cover. So Happy Model has got a STL file for printing uh, project boxes or module empty module boxes if you want to. I also did find one or two online. I'll link them down below. That's something that I noticed in looking around the radios I have that there aren't a lot of these out here uh, or at least a lot of the radios don't come with this. The first thing let's took at, take a look at the, um, the two with ceramic antennas. And this is going to be a little bit hard for me to kind of get organized here. I want to hold them up in the air for you. But these things are so, so small. And that's awesome because I'm into micros and small makes things easier for me for mounting. And I presume it would you as well. Um, let's, uh, so the, oh, almost dropped it. <laughs> the PPRX uh, doesn't have the Wi-Fi abilities. Um, the EP series, uh, it has a little... Wi-Fi antenna right over here. It's probably easier if I just put a picture of it on the uh, screen so that you can see that. But this little ceramic antenna, I mean, it's it's tiny. It's not very tall at all. Here's an example of something. <laughs> this is a tiny boot battery. It's a Nitro Nectar Gold. Uh, this isn't nearly as wide. <laughs> Give you some perspective. I do not have giant hands. So these receivers are super small, and that's excellent for micros. i uh, give you another example. This is a Crossfire receiver. Uh, an RXSR, which when you de-pin them, they're actually pretty small. This is substantially smaller than that. And last but not least is the FR Sky XM Plus, which isn't all necessarily all that small. Necessarily all that small. So... These things are so tiny. Uh, the EP1 has the options for the UFL antennas. Uh, you get two antennas. You get a shorter version and a longer version, depending upon your mounting needs. Uh, the PPRX also has the uh, ceramic antenna. Let's get the scale. So the EP2RX weighs less than a half a gram, and so does the PPRX. The EP1RX weighs less than half a gram. Durr. And I believe this is about a 100 millimeter antenna. So it weighs just a touch over a gram with that long antenna. And with the shorter antenna, it weighs under a gram. So here is the prototype board that I have here. Give you a little close up. Again, this was handmade, I'm told. And I did relocate the antenna a little bit. So that's my soldering job over here. Uh, it was too close to even get a grommet here. So I relocated it ever so slightly. And we have a uh, UFL connector here that's super tiny and super small. And we have kind of a traditional 900 megahertz antenna here. But wanted to give you a quick look at that and this board because we're probably, like I said, going to see the 2.4 gigahertz version coming in about a month. Now, if you're wondering what I flew it in, let me give an example. This is the Avant Quads Avio. And at first glance, if you looked at it, you might think, well, where'd the receiver go? Well, it's this little guy right here. It sits atop the USB port. That's how tiny it is. So that will be our first flight. I'm running this twice, and we'll talk about that when we run it. So it's kind of a skeleton of itself, but this is a TKS-100. It's a ninja frame. This is a prototype frame, and that's what I had in here because this is a 1S board, uh, typical 5-amp uh, ESCs and F4 flight controller with a 25 to 200 milliwatt uh, VTX. I'm running 200 milliwatt on the VTX when we do this test. So let's get that footage rolling. So, like I said, this is the Avant Quads of VO, one of my favorite three inches, and I put the radio in front to try to show that to you, that I'm running the 10 milliwatts, so you can see that through the Express LRS Lua. Hopefully you can see that. Let's stop and blow that up just a touch so you can get a more clear picture of that just to solidify, you know, you might trust me, you might not. And then we're going to fly down this trail. And the trail here, it's going to go out to over 1,400 feet, 
or it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 430 meters. Now, you might look at that and think, well, that's not a great example. No, it's not. I'm low to the ground for safety purposes, and so my kids out there can see it. And so when you get up in the air, your range is really going to be different. And right away, when we take off, you're going to see the RSSI in the top right-hand corner is not going to be impressive. And that's why I'm going to do it twice. But I'm showing you this just as, again, another thing of, you know, you don't know me. You might not trust me, so I'll show it all to you. So this isn't going to take long, so I'm just going to fast forward this just a touch so we get down here towards the end. And here you see we're down towards the corner, and our RSSI is going to get down to almost zero. And our video kind of gets a bit sketchy as we turn around, but not bad. And then we just come on back, and then eventually we'll see the RSSI climb up. Now I'm going to let this play through because I land, I stop my DVR, and I... I noticed the RSSI wasn't impressive on my trip down. I can't explain that, but on the next flight, on the same quad, not even changing batteries or unplugging the battery and start again, note the end time on the end screen when I disarm. You'll find that same uh, start time or fly time uh, when we go to the next uh, section of the DVR footage. Zoom past myself there. It was actually a really nice day. The wind would come up every once in a while and blow it around, but not too bad. So you see there we end at 129. now that we're starting the next section you see 129 so you see those same stats i just grabbed the quad moved it closer now you see the rssi is bouncing around in the mid uh, mid 90s and it gets up to 99 and i noticed that as well hence the reason why i wanted to show it to you again again this is on 10 milliwatts this is the lowest setting that it express lrs or this hardware has and I generally don't get above seven or eight feet in the air. I might get a, I might balloon up a little bit above that when I turn around down in those trees that that cove down here at the end. But at no time did I feel any sort of latency or lag or that it, you know I'd lost control or anything like that. You can see I'm cruising along at a pretty good speed. And then I slow down and we come down here to the little corner, which is on the map that I'm showing you on the other side of the screen. And we turn around and we come back. And you also see the VTX that I've got there is running 400 milliwatts. So to make sure not to lose my video, I used a quad that had a nice strong VTX. Of course, you know, the solo tank can go well above that. But uh, for my purposes, uh, this was a quad I trusted the VTX on. So I picked it out of the group. And our RSSI is climbing back up. Oddly enough, even when the RSSI got low, it was not calling out a warning. Now, that could be that I don't have something set up on my radio, but I thought the radios were sensitive to low RSSI and would just have the audible call out because I've heard it in SPI receivers on this radio. Next up is the all-in-one board. This is 900 megahertz, which may not interest too many of you because I know there's a good portion of the uh, flying space that can't use 900 megahertz. But this is, again, the first all-in-one with a 900 megahertz built-in receiver. And here I am again trying to show you that I'm running 10 milliwatts on that. I've uh, got to fuss with the radio a little bit to get the screen to light up because I had set the uh, dim time pretty quick on myself of uh, previous usage. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, different radio, of course, though, as well because I had both radios out with me, one with uh, the 2.4 gigahertz and one with the 900 megahertz version. Now this is, a again, the TKS95 Ninja frame. It's a little bit of a um, prototype frame that Kevin and I have been flying around and working on, and probably others as well. Please forgive the jello. I did some tuning while I was out with this, but not a lot. Uh, I think it comes down to my camera's probably jiggling around inside the canopy. Because I did spend quite a bit of time, well, not quite a bit of time, about three batteries at this spot, and I was getting yelled at by the kids. <laughs> so uh, off we go, jello and all, and you can see the winds kind of shoving me around as we get out past uh, some of that tree cover that we have. And we've got RSSI, it's just above the uh, throttle number on the right hand side. Again, the, the RSSI numbers aren't impressive. Uh, to me, um, and probably not to you, but again, this is very, very low. You get up in the air a fair bit, and it's going to be substantially better. Again, with the 900 megahertz, I didn't feel a delay. I didn't feel like I'd lost control. I didn't feel like anything awry was going on. We're going to make it all the way down to the little corner. That is, again, it is 1,400 and 
22 feet, uh, 433 meters away. Video is going to get a little bit sketchy. Again, we're running 200 milliwatts on this little all-in-one, but surprisingly, it held in there, allowed me to turn around and come back. So that's pretty good performance, I think, from the, the VTX as well as the onboard uh, 900 megahertz Express LRS uh, receiver. So that's, that's great, and then we just come on back. The next section, I'm just going to... I thought I needed to include what happens with an SPI receiver in this location. Give you some basis of understanding for where our typical SPI receivers might fail safe at the same location on the same day. Let's go ahead and jump into that. We don't need to watch the flight footage all the way back. So you can see there I've got the, the Moby light and I've got my little jumper uh, T light. RSI is bouncing around in the upper 80s, somewhere in the 80s. Uh, we're going to take off and start to fly this out. Of course, the wind is really going to push this little guy around. I've got a 600 milliamp 1S battery in there <laughs> to make sure I have plenty of battery because I knew I was going to be flying to fail safe and therefore I needed it to stay powered for my, my walk, however long that might be. Um, the kids really weren't much help. They, they said, it's over here. And then I went over there and didn't find it. I'm going to speed this up. I don't think you want to see every painful moment of the cruise. Uh, I'll just fast forward. So if you wanted to actually see it in real time, you could use the YouTube gear icon and play it in a slower speed that might appear to be more real time. You can always keep a hold of the uh, clock down there. I'm going to move it. Okay, so video is getting a little bit sketchy here. And it's going to RX loss. And we're only going to see it for a second. So keep your eyes peeled. There it is, RX loss. And you can already see on the map, uh, how far that that particular uh, receiver took us, which was uh, surprisingly 247 meters or 800 feet. I didn't expect it to go nearly that far. Let me fast forward again as I go on the walk to retrieve. You see the video starting to come back ever so slightly, getting a little bit of that snow. Oh, it's pretty clear now, and our RSSI is climbing again. So I've got to be getting close. It's got to be right there. So close. And I've arrived. <laughs> One of the reasons why I kept it so low, because I didn't want to get in that brush, you know, flying micros. Uh, that would be problematic. Okay, so the next thing I thought I would show is the binding process, which is fairly unique. Uh, because, again, they don't have buttons on them, and it's not a binding command as far as Betaflight right now. Uh, so you have to use a power sequence here. Uh, I'm going to get out my long nose USB cable here. And pay close attention to the light on the receiver. It'll light up, it'll go away, and then you want to unplug. That's the key to the binding sequence. If you leave it in, it will eventually come back on. And if you leave it in a long time, it'll eventually go to a super fast flicker. But that's not binding mode. you got to follow the, the three-step sequence here. So let's uh, plug in. Yeah, it went out. You see the orange light came up right here and it went out. Do it again. Went out. See the double flash? Now we're ready to bind. This one's already bound. But so at this point in your model menu for OpenTX, you would set it to crossfire. You would then go into your tools. Uh, you need to have the Lua script already downloaded on your SD card for tools. You launch the uh, uh, Lua script, the Express LRS or ELRS, I think is as it says. Uh, you launch that and you do your binding through that menu. Uh, that's also where you set the power and the refresh rate that uh, you're going to be running on that particular receiver. So I wanted to show you that. And it's the same way on the all-in-one board here. The all-in-one board does have a slightly different timing sequence to it. So we've got right by the antenna wire here, there is a red light, not an amber or orange light. So I'm going to wait for that to light up. And then when it goes out, I'm going to unplug. Okay, now it should go into binding mode. There we go. All set to bind. Hopefully you can see those little flashing lights. There is, There does appear to be an even smaller green light between those two red lights. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Also, let's take a look at this image on screen of the all-in-one board itself so you can see all the pinouts, all the different things that it has on it. Uh, it points out you know, little details that you might be um, particular to. There's also an ST-Link area that you see up there. 
if you were to want to do some sort of programming yourself, uh, it does have a buzzer pad, so you can add buzzer pads. And then it also points out that it's got a VTX ground. So if you wanted to do a circular polarized antenna on the board, you certainly could do that. And I think that would be another benefit to our racers, I think. I don't race tiny whoops, but my thought is that multipathing is going to be worse inside, especially when you have multiple quads running. So putting a little circular polarized antenna or just any other antenna that does better with multipathing than uh, a linear or dipole. Maybe it's not necessary. Tiny Whoop Racers, please please tell me. Uh, correct me on that again. I don't do any racing. And then we have the other side of the board where you can see that the different 5 volts, camera in, camera out. So you don't have to use the connector if you don't want to. Uh, there's also spots on the board for LED uh, there's also a boot button, of course. Uh, then you've got um, RX and TX2. Uh, we've got our ground and our LiPo. And then, of course, we've got all of our different uh, motor connectors, M1 through M4. So the last thing to talk about here is probably the fact that the, the wiring here, you can't really see it. I don't think it's labeled, or at least I can't see it, especially through the camera viewfinder. Uh, so essentially, you've got power and ground. It might be the other way around. Again, I'm shooting from the hip here, but you've got TX and RX, and, and TX and RX get switched. So RX on the receiver goes to TX on the board, TX on the receiver goes to RX on the board. And then you enable uh, serial connection on that UART, whichever UART you're using, whether it's UART 2, 3, 6, what have you. You enable that UART, you go down on the configuration page, you select Crossfire as your uh, protocol, and then you do your binding process if you haven't already, and then it's all set and ready to go. Maybe after that you want to run, you know, the Lua script to change the, the frequency or the power that you're running at. The last thing to talk about is, as I mentioned, is another video. Uh, I'm not going to recreate it uh, because I think he did a wonderful job and there's no point in me trying to steal views from someone else. Uh, so I'm going to point you to Joseph de Guzman, his video uh, known as Kaiju. That will be in the video description down below. That takes you through the process of updating OpenTX, open updating, excuse me, uh, the TX inside the radio, not technically inside, your module. Um, and using the uh, Express LRS configuration as well as your option to do the Wi-Fi update in the case that you have the EP2 receiver. Uh, it did a great job. It's not talking. It's just text on the screen. So it's very straightforward and simple. Makes it easy to pause. There's some music there. You can mute that if you don't want to hear it. I think it's, uh, it does everything that you would need to uh, know as far as getting to that next level of Express LRS. And of course, Express LRS is an open source project. So who knows uh, what's next for that? Uh, some people, there, there's been some heated debate online about Express LRS and its use cases. If you've chosen your protocol already and you're going with Crossfire, you're going with Ghost, as I said earlier, good on you. I think this is going to be very important for micros. If you fly larger quads, it may be of benefit there, especially with the size of these receivers. They're so tiny and they're not very expensive. I think the most expensive receiver is $21. They go down from there. Of course, you can buy R9, FR Sky R9 hardware and do the flashing on those things. You don't have to buy this stuff. Um, you can also make your own. There are some people who are making these receivers themselves. They're getting all the different components from wherever they get them, and then they're putting them together on a PCB, and they're making this hardware themselves. So all sorts of ways you can go about running Exp Express LRS. In my case, I'm not one to spend a lot of time doing those other things of building it or doing a lot of flashing because of limited time with family and work and everything. So this is super convenient. And if you're like me, you might want to check these out. Again, everything is linked down in the video description. Don't forget, check your radio for a project box. If you're using a gamepad like I like to run as far as the radio goes, uh, we look for a slim version of the 2.4 gigahertz version coming out in about a month. I'm, that's just a guess. I don't know that for certain. But if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, or otherwise, please let me know in the comment section below. I appreciate your time. Thanks for watching.